Indie Shooter. Brought to you by Akidio, Band Pro Film and Digital, Black Magic Design, and Carl Size. Well, it's also amazing to me uh, to to watch this tonight. Um, a lot of my subsequent viewing after it had been in theaters was a VHS, and then I think I had a laser disc, and then the DVD, and all of this progress uh, to see it in 4K with a uh, I believe this is a laser unit isn't laser it? <laughs> or a projector the, the file is a 2K file but right. it does a good job of, of yeah it's amazing okay. to look at the the 2K we um, yeah even, even though this was 2K John and I did a uh, 4K recently that's what Brett was telling me yeah, yeah. Um, which would have been interesting to see um, a 4K on 4K yeah for sure but uh, this was uh, actually pretty amazing I mean the uh, the, the laser, the color, the blacks, the everything. The demo in the beginning where they, they yeah. show the light, like right. the mostly black and then it goes to pitch black, because always yeah. kind of gets me. Yeah. It's very cool. But but also the uh, the fact that um, this this movie had um, that kind of of range um, was, you know, remarkable. It was almost like watching off the original negative. Like an answer print, like yeah. first gen type of thing. Yeah. Like, we're going to see this, but the audience will never see this. I exactly. Yeah. I, I remember, you know, early on when I would go to Technicolor Deluxe somewhere and time the answer prints to these movies. Shoot it on original negative, they make answer prints off of the original negative, wow. and you look at it and say, oh, well, not too, a little bluer. Yeah, that's good. And it's like th right. three generations later, yeah. the audience sees and then, it. And then I would say to the timer, I said, you know, we've spent a lot of time making this perfect. Will, will the audience uh, see it just like this? And he would say, <laughs> what are you, nuts? <laughs> you know, you know yeah, there's going to be more grain. There's, and, and then every batch is a little more... A couple cyan, degrees here, a couple degrees a there. Yeah. We try to match the the reels up with it, but we don't always do it, and you know, so it was, was kind of, you know, a little disheartening to know we spend so much time, you know, and we're we're now getting closer to the fact that what we do, will actually show up, like yeah, with like one to one, exactly. you know, color decisions right. and the, and so, the lighting well, decisions. It's getting closer and closer. It's but, neat. but you know, I always have that feeling that. Um, even though the the prints in those days were not all, you know, exactly answer prints or mm -hmm. what we'd hoped, um, the audience generally, if they liked the movie, they went to see it, yeah. and it's the same now as you know. So we we are so meticulous about things and which lenses and no, I like the Zeiss. No, no, <laughs> what are you crazy? You know, we should shoot on a twenty five. We should shoot on a twenty four. Yeah, we should. Yeah. You know. And um, and by the time the audience watches it, they're saying, "Hey, that was pretty funny. You want to <laughs> you want to go for some pizza?" Right. You know, <laughs> nobody sits and says, "Oh my God, I can't believe the resolution." That, you know, so so a, a lot of what we do is we do it for ourselves, I think, but that's not a bad thing necessarily. Right. So seeing this on the on the big screen, the set in the second row, I like on the home video, watching it on Blu-ray, DVD, whatever, I didn't notice the how much matte painting there was. And now I see that there's like so much crazy matte painting. It's, it's, um, and that's, that's done back then with blue screen film process, right? Yeah, um, Al Whitlock, who was the uh, visual effects guy, um, was the master matte painter um, at uh, Universal. And um, his process was, you know, very meticulous and very skilled, and, and um, it, it, it was fascinating to uh, to sit in with him while he was painting, and while he his um, he had two guys that were really very good. He used to do all those Hitchcock movies, right? Yeah, um, and uh, he w he would do original negative. We would shoot the uh, the, the shot up in the in the uh, well, the snow, the, 
British the Columbia. Antarctic, but mm -hmm. uh, it was up actually in the Arctic. But it's like uh, northern Canada, yeah, somewhere around there. So confusing, isn't it? Um, that, um, but we would put a black mat, or he would put a black mat in front of the um, camera, and he would not expose. We would not expose uh, the bottom half of the frame or this part of the frame over here, or whatever. And that's like an, in the mat box, or yeah. it's in in the mat box in front of the camera, uh, with a camera where you could look through the aperture and and line up everything. Um, and then he would not develop that film. He would take it back to Universal. Uh, he would develop, you know, a few frames of it so that he could line up that, and he'd put it into the the camera with a, a punch frame, as he called it. And he would look through those frames, and then he would meticulously mark and, and then expose the original negative that we had done. Using we, the same lens from exactly. like the same So instead of the positioning positing that, um, um, you know, that we do, uh, we did then with uh, a duplicate negative and making duplicate prints and all of that, right. he, he would be doing it on original negative. So, uh, there was no suddenly there's no matte lines, no nothing, no 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 but grain. It depends no, completely on perfect handwork. No work. contrast. To, yeah, he would he would, and then <clears throat> yeah, he had a, a a knack of um, doing things like uh, after the fact, um, he would do something that gave life to the painted. Yeah, I, I, when they're in, when again they see the hatch in the beginning, they're flying right. there in the helicopter. They get to the hatch. There's like a moving light. Over the top of yeah, he the, would, the map painting. He would do stuff camera. that looked like moving clouds, and he would add moving clouds to the sky. And um, he uh, he showed me a, one thing that he had been working on simultaneously, um, which was a um, I think it was a big shot of like a castle on a hill. He added little animated flags that were waving, um, anything that would give life to, to the dead painted part, um, you know. So um, this movie was a fascinating look at, um, you know, what a, a, an amazing master right. of the time. You know, now yeah. now it's the kind of stuff you can do in your uh, on your Mac, in your phone, or something, in your yeah. mother's basement. Right. You know. <laughs> um, also, visual effects, uh, physical effects. You know, like all this, the monster effects and all that stuff. It's very different than what's typically done today. Yeah, and you know, I. I, I look at this, there are two shots in there that were um, that were stop motion, that were animated, where that were um, an optical effect. Um, and there was supposed to be more, but John didn't like the look of it because it was grainy. Right. Uh, the stop motion was stuttery as stop motion It didn't is. have motion blur or right. anything. Um, you know, so um, we went back and reshot re the, the ending where the, the thing comes up through the floor and blows up the the um, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so we went back and um, redid close-ups uh, using Rob Boutin's, you know. Wow. Yeah, I heard he was a stuff. maniac on that shoot. Like he was oh, living yeah. on set, basically. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Rob Rob was fascinating. I'd worked with him on a couple of little low-budget movies, Ro Roger Corman stuff. Um, but this was sort of his big, um, his big opportunity. Yeah. And... He was very meticulous. Um, I, you know, I, I look at this film and say because it's all practical effects, there's a sense of reality to it compared to now. You know, you'd probably say, oh, well, we'll put that all in later. And, right. And and there's always something, no matter how good it is, a little funny looking about the, you know, just digital, um, you know, animation. And uh, this had a sense of reality, and I I think that sometimes um, the digital guys do stuff because they can, you know. And and so instead of saying, oh yeah, um, let's do a shot of you know the thing and it moves like this, mm -hmm. someone else will say, yeah, and you know what else we could do? This is awesome, yeah. and they would add that, and someone else would say, oh, not only that, but you know what else right. we could do. And pretty soon, um, and I think the audience knows when too much has been done because we all have a sense of, you know, reality, physics, how fast does something fall or blow up or whatever. Um, 
you know, how in, how in the world is a film out you know, now or coming out Bumblebee? How in the world does that giant thing come out of a Volkswagen? I don't know if you've seen the trailers, but yeah. it, you know, the fenders fold out and suddenly it's like 50 times bigger. They do the same thing with the plot too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, so it's, it's sort of like um, somebody said, you know, you know what we could do? And they do it. Right. And, um, you know, so um, no matter what, when you watch it as, a, as an audience, you know, there's a sense that uh, I've been tricked, you know. Yeah. Well, with the thing, there was a, you know, a reality. And um, lighting um, was very carefully done because Rob would say, I like this part of the sculpture, but this part sucks. I, ha I had to go get dinner or something, right? <laughs> and um, so I hate that. So let's keep this dark. And so there was this style imposed early on about lighting just uh, very sketchily some parts of the sculptures, the, the thing. Yeah, it always adds in like and, a horror movie though, like you want to like, yeah. you, you're surprised by what's taken away, right. what you're shown. And, and so that, um, that sort of, uh, you know, dictated a lot of the rest of it is, you know, there, there's so much darkness and, and sources of light that are just in areas. So it was, um, I think that, that, that helps serve the, the tension in the plot of the film, though, right? Oh, absolutely, you know. Um, it, it's sort of the, um, a, a combination of a lot of people who understood and, and embellished and... and um, Feels you know, like there's a lot of teamwork. Yeah, it was definitely... Feels like a lot of yeah. teamwork on the screen. And, there. I mean, the, the physical effects guy, uh, Roy Arbogast, was, um, you know, really, really very good at... Um, you know, just doing stuff that you shouldn't do in front of people, um, a big crowd crew, uh, blowing stuff up. That all of the explosions at the end, you know, were all real. Um, now it would be, uh, they'd say, well, put a little explosion, we'll make it bigger. And, right. and it, it, just blow it always... Just blow the door open, yeah. we'll, we'll blow the house open. Later. Exactly. Right. And it always looks a little funny. Uh, you know, you can tell fire when it's... Digital yeah, and stuff I like think that. it's deep within, deep in the human psyche. Right. Um, the sort of non-technical question, or maybe maybe a, a deeper technical question, but it's a ensemble piece. Obviously, there's a lot of different people in it. Do you guys make any specific creative decisions when you were thinking about that? Like, how are we going to keep so many people in the frame? Or well, um, John and I always loved. The, the anamorphic uh, aspect ratio, um, two, three, five, I think at the time. Now you can fudge it to whatever, but, um, and um, a lot a lot of that is, and I, you know, when I talk about it, um, there, there's an awful lot of, of uh, psychology and physics, uh, phys physiology and stuff about how we, as people, perceive stuff. And we see wider than we do see up and down. Our peripheral vision sideways is more. So rather than cutting it off into 185 or 3 by 4 or whatever, um, you know, John and I always love the anamorphic ratio because it is closer to how you would perceive the world. But also it, it uh, allows you to dramatically um, influence the audience. You know, there's a... Uh, all of the subtleties of composition, how do you direct the audience's attention to certain things, the face, the, you know, or <clears throat> do you put the, the uh, character way off to one side and now there's lurking room off to the rest of it and, and does that make you, um, you know, nervous as an audience wondering like Using what's negative happen, space you know. and that kind of thing. So there, there's a lot of that kind of stuff and uh, plus we knew that there were always going to be um, you know, quite a number of guys in the frame at the same time. Um, and, and we did stuff with split diopters so that we could have hold focus way in the background and in the foreground and, and uh, stuff like that to use um, the frame as storytelling rather than cutting to, you know. So oh, some of this is, how much of this is shot in L.A. of the movie? 
Um, the, the opening, Chasing the Dog, um, was done in, uh, uh, outside of Juneau, Alaska, um, and the, the helicopter stuff. The, uh, the set was built um, on a rocky cropping uh, above a um, glacier wow. in British Columbia. Um, so the exteriors were all real. Um, so when they're like burning the guys out in the, in the area exactly. and all that stuff. Anything exterior with all that snow. Um, because we didn't want to have to make a bunch of snow. Sure. And, and it always looks phony. And you can't see the, the camp and then all of those mountains in the background and stuff. So uh, all of the exteriors um, were done in either British Columbia or, or Juneau. Um, the interiors were all done at Universal, um, including uh, the creeping through the Norwegian building where it was very cold. Oh. Um, the uh, the uh, basement in the at the end where the generator room um, that was at Universal, and we refrigerated the stages so that you could see the breath. Wow! How long um, does that take? Um, time? <clears throat> well. It, it requires two things. Cold has to be around freezing, just above freezing. And it also requires a high humidity in the air. Um, the air has to be pretty close to 100% for, in order to see your breath. Right, like in a shower or something, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, the stage, we they brought in big giant air conditioners. They would run all night. So they have to seal the stage or to put in the in extra insulation or is it just they just no, don't No, most AC of them were, because they were soundproof, yeah. um, had thick walls and, and uh, universal. Um, stage 27 was one of them. Um, you know, it was, was big, but um, you know, it had, the, the walls were thick. We, we found out later they were insulated with asbestos. Of course, yes. But Good old American that's another story. of the 30s. Um, <clears throat> but um, the, um, you know, we would put up overhead misters, as, as uh, Roy Arbogast called them, um, which were really essentially uh, spray guns um, and nozzles and so forth. And um, they would be able to turn them on from the floor and the ceiling moisture would mist down. And then by uh, the combination of the very cold from the air conditioning and the high humidity that these created, uh, you could see the breath. And, and then was, they're, they're up 100 yeah. feet up in the air or whatever, uh, so up, they, yeah, you don't up, see, up in the you don't see the actual no. um, the, you know, the cloud and, coming and down. And a lot of times they would, they would run, but they would make noise, uh, if you get the feeling. Um, and so we would just shut them off during the shot. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, there was a lot of technique and craftsmanship that went into making this film. A lot of um, thinking about uh, how do we make it look like this, you know. There's, there's stuff like, um, I wanted something uh, different looking as far as how they lit stuff. You know, only flashlights I thought would be kind of boring. So. So I thought, well, let's see about flares. And we shot about six different ones. Uh, the regular roadside flares turned out to be the most interesting because they were very bright, uh, but they had this really unusual magenta color. And um, so we said, yeah, let's, let's use those. And uh, Kurt was very good. He, uh, he's a great technical actor. I would say, you know, it has to be just about eye level and it has to be two and a half feet away from your face for the right exposure. And he would hit it every time. Zoop. Um, so um, <clears throat> that, that was, you know, great. They, they are, interestingly enough, I think we could never use them now uh, because, um, you know, all that stuff dripping is liquid sulfur. Um, is, you know, the, the uh, fumes, that, uh, the smoke that is off, goes off is very uh, sulfur intensive. Um, I'm sure Critical it's all, safety flares. Yeah. yeah. And they're, um, it's, you know, it's all carcinogenic or something. Oh, yeah. You know, you, Somebody, yeah. They have gluten in them, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so um, 
you know, we would never be allowed to use them now. The fire marshal would say, what are you, crazy? So you guys firing flamethrowers inside of a studio? Yeah, uh, flamethrowers yeah. in the studio and intensive, all of that. Uh, Let's see, it, like the insurance yeah. agent, it, prop, like 2018 insurance agent. Exactly. Not okay oh, no, we yeah. would, there would have been lawyers from the, uh, the main office down there. Um, um, so it was it was a unique kind of thing, and and the fact that we were able to use all of this technique and stuff is is kind of remarkable, but gives it a very unique kind of look, I think. Oh yeah, I mean, because you did a lot of this stuff for real. Exactly, almost. You know, I mean, the reality is that everything is real, if that's not redundant. Um, you know, with all the 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 flames and the the. Uh, Torch light and the, um, well, all, all of that kind of stuff was yes. great, the snow. Um, what was it like shooting on location? You know, it was it was a fascinating, um, fascinating location, and I still look back at it fondly and with amusement. Um, we were up in Stewart, British Columbia. Um, Stewart is a small town, way up on the uh, Alaskan border. Um, and right exactly on the border. And it exists because up above it is a mine. A, uh, I think it was a tin mine. And uh, the miners would all work up there and they lived in dormitory, dormitories. And there was this little one lane dirt road that took uh, almost an hour to traverse from where the location was and the mine down to Stewart, which is this old west town. It's as close to an old west town as you can get. A lot of wooden buildings and, and you know, um, it, it exists because the miners will come down on the weekend um, and there were bars, or there were uh, little funky hotels. The mine is still active at this time? I don't know, you know, I, okay. I haven't been up there. No, I mean like when you guys were there. Oh, absolutely. Really? But the miners were always kind of pissed off that uh, the Hollywood people had moved in and, and hey buddy, yeah. you're on my stool here at the bar. Well, I'm just having a, that's my stool, you know. So uh, um, <clears throat> they it, it became this sort of strange thing the day we were off, Sundays when they were off. So um, <laughs> it, it became an interesting look at the culture of, uh, and um, Sunday, I mean, it's in Canada, Sunday you can't drink or, or sell liquor. That's the day you had off? Yeah. Mm. So uh, the miners would come down and on Saturday nights, you know, it was not a problem. On Sunday nights, they would travel not very far to this little town of Hyder, Alaska, right across the Alaskan border. And there, those Americans would be selling booze. And uh, so they would travel over there to uh, Hyder, Alaska. Only, um, the, only the miners, not like PAs from your production? No, no, none Gosh, of us. No. Okay. None of us ever. That would be, yeah. No. Ill-advised. So it was a, a fascinating, you know, I mean, I, I go to uh, locations in almost anywhere else, small town America, Kentucky or whatever, and it's all recognizable and there's, there's a culture and there's all of that stuff. Um, this was really a unique look at, um, you know, a different kind of social structure and, and culture. That's awesome. Uh, what was it like? Like, uh, how do you guys have any gear problems, or did you guys have to like get into it with the just get creative? Well, it was running. It was uh, cold up there. Um, there were times when it was, you know, below zero, by like twenty or whatever. Um, one of the issues we had before I went up there was I went to Panavision because it was obviously Panavision cameras and film. Um, <clears throat> and I, I said, well, now, so what's the, what's the deal going to be with these cameras and this below freezing? They said, okay, well, we'll fix you all up. So they, <coughs> they replaced the, the grease and the lube on the movements with a low temperature one and gave us um, a supply of that. Um, they had uh, heaters built into the cameras um, and in the eyepieces to keep them just, you know, above freezing. 
Um, and we had to be very meticulous with all of that. Uh, but there were little things we didn't know until we got up there. <coughs> For instance, the, uh, the, the lenses, um, if you go outside and you work with them, they're fine. The minute you bring them inside, um, condensation appears. And not just on the surface of it. Right. Inside the inside, core of the lens. You know, the various layers. Um, and the guys discovered this when they would take the camera into the camera room, which had been built in the set. And the lenses would fog up and they'd say, oh, well, let's wipe it. Oh, wait, we can't wipe the inside. So um, we would put a 2K light or something shiny on the lens to heat it up. Well, rather than do that all the time, they finally decided that they would never let the lens warm up or go in inside. So the camera room had the doors removed and the windows, um, <laughs> and these poor assistants would work outside in the cold in their parkas and, and stuff, and then they would take the cameras inside to load them and service them and stuff, and it would be freezing in there. So they never got out of uh, the cold. You know, we were always doing something that, um, you know, was specific to the movie, and some some of the stuff hadn't been done before. A lot of Rob's sculptures and and uh, the mechanics for that, and we were always hiding cables and and uh, then lighting just you know parts of it. So, um, I for instance, the dog um, pound. Um, I knew that we were going to have to have darkness and, and pools of light, um, so um, I, I decided that um, you know there would be lights outside casting shadows inside, but the inside um, you know shaded light uh, would have to go out so it could be dark, and you know so there was this whole thought process all the time about how to you know best do something or other, and. Um, you know, so it, it w was a lot of fun. Um, the hallway lights, I remember the halls, um, wanting it to look like just those china hats, as we called them, um, were lighting. And that worked out very well. But uh, you couldn't see any of the ceiling, um, after, you know, because all the light went down. Um, so I, I had the guys put little tiny incandescent bulbs from very small units and attach them to the back of the shades. Um, and they were on dimmers so that, you know, the wires would run over here. We could adjust it so we could light the ceiling without any other lights, you know, because it would be only the, the you, ceiling. You, you hid them inside the practicals? Um, on the back side of the shade. Um, so there was a light inside and one on the outside of the shade, but a very small one. Um, so there was an awful lot of thought process that went into um, that, and it's um, you know it's kind of rewarding for people to not notice that, it, which is the whole idea of what we do is to suck people into the story and the characters and not have them notice you know what we did and how we did it. <laughs> there was so much fire, <laughs> it, you know. And and uh, Roy, um, the effects guy who was in charge of all that, would always, you know, explain to us that there was, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> I I wanted that to happen. Um, <laughs> you know, so did it look cool? Yeah, yeah. It always it, it, it was it, the it was the eighties. It was a different time. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you know those fires, we could never have them now. It, it's a big deal. I I just recently worked on a on a, uh, a little uh, movie, and we wanted to have some candles, and they said, oh. No, we can't afford <laughs> the two firemen, the truck, and the fire marshal, um, just for some candles. And um, you know, they said, "Well, suppose the candle falls over," and they said, "Well, you'd step on it and put it out." Oh no, we have to have professionals. So you look at all of the wow. fire we had, the explosions, the, the <laughs> doors that are blown off in the hallway at the end. Um, Roy, who, who is a master, that, that's like in a studio here, right? Yeah, that was at Universal. Uh, Ma uh, Roy, who is a master explosionist, is that the it, it is. That's yes. the term? Yes. Yeah. 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 Let's go with um, that one. He, um, you know, uh, and I was always fascinated by this stuff because I, early on, 
one of my first movies, we had an effects guy who was a little risky. Um, and things didn't always happen when the things blew up, the cars, parts, and stuff like that. So I, I became fascinated with understanding how this stuff worked. And uh, Roy was extremely good. He had these mortars outside the doors, and he would put a black powder bomb in it, but fill it with sand. And the sand being blown out through the doors is what tore the building up, and, but it wasn't uh, dangerous. Um, in theory, unless you were standing in front of it stupidly. Um, it wasn't uh, dangerous. It was all this very, very thoughtfully controlled physics. And, um, and, and so it, you know, all of that stuff was masterfully done to, you know, be very creatively uh, destructive. How many days was the shoot? Um, no, I'd, I'd have to go back through. It was some records between the location and the studio. Yeah, it, there was more than a year, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, I know that we shot uh, in Juno first with the helicopter flying through the over the snow and chasing the dog and stuff, um, which was another fascinating location. It was a glacier research camp, a half hour by helicopter outside of Juno, out in the middle of above a glacier and. And it was a uh, research camp that belonged to a university, I believe, uh, where they would train their glaciologists. Is that, is that right? It is. Okay. <clears throat> and um, so we lived up there in a sample of what it was like to live in the Antarctic in, in a very remote, you know, and it was, it was fascinating because we had uh, dormitories and bunk beds and, and uh, the outhouses were outside and there was a hole and then it would drop down through the cliff below. Wow. Um, there was, um, you know, feed, uh, we, we would eat at a, this little dining cabin and, you know, so we were completely isolated, no radio. Um, and if we wanted to have a message sent, um, the helicopter guy would fly and get to some altitude over that cliff so that he could send it to another station that would send it. So we had, we were out in the middle of nowhere. And it was, uh, it, it was just, you know, it set us up early on for what it was like. And I, and I think that it, was the opening of the movie was the, yeah, the exactly. first days were out there. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And then we came back and we did some more prep. Um, and then we began working uh, in the studio and the end of the, the film was we went up to British Columbia in the winter. And um, when there was actual snow um, that surrounded, that's where you the, do like the courtyard scenes. And yeah, the all, all of the, the set, all the, the exterior set. Um, they they built it in the summer or late summer, on top of this ro these rocks, so it was built on a solid foundation, and then they waited for it to get snowed in, and uh, so it was a it was a uh, an amazing. That's pretty you know, cool. Experience. You guys built the sets in summer, yeah. wait, and then like you knew six months later you're going to be filming. Exactly. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Um, Brett, who put this event together, told me a really funny story that um, at McMurdo Research Base is that correct in Antarctica? Right when the winter comes in and the last plane leaves, they gather all the researchers and they watch this movie oh. after the last plane is gone. Oh. <laughs> I wanted to let you know that if you didn't know that. Well, what a, what a great thing. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Sequences I especially enjoyed. Um, I don't know. I mean, they, they all had such great um, challenges. Um, it's, it's hard to say. The, uh, um, the, one of the sequences that I, I have all the storyboards for is the, the sequence where um, you know, the doc is trying to revive and the chest opens up and the head, and, you know, and all that stuff. I was uh, all bits and pieces of uh, weird things that Rob had built with the spider legs and the, you know, or the crab legs or whatever. Um, and I have the storyboards for that. And recently I, I uh, said, oh, look at these storyboards. They, they're pretty close to what we shot. So I, uh, I had an editor friend of mine take the, the uh, sequence apart and put on the right side of the frame the shots and the left side the storyboards. 
and it's a fascinating look into that that sequence. It was, uh, you know, how it was pre-visualized, um, and then actually came to be. It's really neat. I, I saw the making of of this recently, mm -hmm. and just that scene in particular. There's like a shot overhead where the guy goes through the body. Right. That's one shot, and with the actor and like a maquette, mm -hmm. and the guy's head. His real head is there, right? And he's underneath. His head, his his body is like here, and then mm. he has the fake body out here. Right. It's one shot. Goes in. The other shot is like where the the sternum crunches his hands off. Right. That's a, mm -hmm. two models. Right. And then there's a shot, uh, low angle, where the guy goes back like this. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that they made a rubber face mask for right. of mm -hmm. the original actor, and right. they found a double amputee. Right. And they put like blood spurting things on there. Exactly. Spray around, and then there's like another shot of the guy's actor close up, right? And then he's screaming, but it all appears as if it's one moment. But they're yeah. like each scene is a completely different rig. I thought that was pretty fascinating. You, you just revealed our secret. This was supposed to be a secret, though. Now they won't believe any of that. <laughs> so, no, it's it's uh. You know, and, and you look at that, uh, and again, it's like um, pre-visualizing, doing the storyboards, um, walking around saying the storyboard's here, and, you know, storyboard was drawn for the set. So it was a, a, a lot of cooperation between the visualizing people and, and um, John and myself and, and the prop guys and Rob, and, you know, so it was... Um, to me, the, the ideal sort of um, way to to do that, um, you know, because it it becomes a very very carefully crafted, um, you know, cooperation uh, between the um, the visual uh, people, you know, the special effects people, and like and what will work in a wide shot, and what exactly. Will work in a close up. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting when the first time I met John um, before Halloween. Um, he said, "Well, let's let's look at some films." And he he had in his house this amazing device. It was a box about this big, and you'd push a button, and the little door would come up, and then he could put in a video tape, <laughs> close it down, and it would run on his television. And um, he had, uh, and it was, it was at this point, it was three quarter inch. It hadn't gotten a VHS yet. Well, yeah. hmm? I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, oh yeah, big top loading, yeah. three quarter. And and um, so it was uh, fascinating. And um, John said, "Well, let's look at some movies." And he uh, he liked Hitchcock um, before building suspense. So Halloween was all about Hitchcock. Um, but part of it was, he said, you know, and then the other thing I really love, Howard Hawks, because um, his dialogue, the, he overlaps and it's fast and everything, and then, and he said, and I love this movie, and we watched a movie called The Thing. And um, he said, I, I just love it. So he played part of that on the television while we were shooting um, Halloween. The kids are watching The Thing. So he was obsessed early um, in his career. And um, so then one day when he calls me up, he said, guess what? They've asked us to do the thing. And he was so excited that he um, actually raised his uh, eyebrows and um, you know, spoke in a higher voice. That's how excited he was. Uh, <clears throat> but it was, it was fascinating because uh, um, you know, they, it, we came around full circle from just watching it and enjoying it to, you know, remaking it. You know, I, I'm, I feel very sort of redeemed because, you know, we put a lot of effort, as you can tell, uh, thought, <clears throat> creativity, everything into making that film. And when it was released and there were two choices for the audience, you could see the thing all about this bad alien. Or you could go see E.T. about this happy alien. <laughs> the audience chose the happy alien. So, um, and, and I think part of it is uh, John's endings tend to be 
you know, sort of nihilistic and, and um, um, you know, we, you don't know exactly who's who in the end of it. So I think that was part of the reason the audience went away saying, well, wait, what happened? Right. So um, as a result, when it first came out, of course, <coughs> it, um, it didn't have the warm reception that the, you know, that everyone hoped. And uh, so um, it, it's really redeeming to see the fact that that film and, and um, you know, a few of the others that I've, I've worked on are getting uh, recognition and appreciation by, by an audience that, um, um, you know, says, hey, look at, uh, I guess it was pretty creative or, um, they haven't done this in a while, and you know that kind of thing. So, so I feel very redeemed by, um, you know, being being able to um, see how how an audience, you know, I, I mean, I, I I will go to a convention or something, <coughs> and some some guy will come up and he's in his thirties, and he'll say, you know. This is one of the best films. It's the first film my parents let me watch. You know, which I have two reactions, which is, um, you know, how great that it, you know, it has this audience. And then also about, oh, get out of here, you little twerp. Um, I was very old when you were watching this movie. I wasn't that old, but, um, and uh, so it's it's nice to see that. and. And then, uh, and his little son will say, yeah, we just, dad and I watched it together. And here's like three, maybe four, genera <laughs> th four generations of people who are, you know, re-enjoying re it. And, and it's, you know, great to know that, um, you know, it's, it's found an audience. Well, you know, I, um, when I talk to film students in, co as in college, especially as I do, um, one of the things I point out is that, um, well, first, first of all, I think of film as the greatest, most inclusive art form ever invented. Now, that sounds pretty pretentious, you know, and, and I'll get a snicker from students, and then I'll say, well, think about it. There's no other art form that isn't part of making film sculpture and architecture and literature and painting and so forth and so forth. And so much, so many sciences, you know, we touch, especially in special effects, we touch in all kinds of sciences. Um, and there's, you know, literature and storytelling, as I mentioned. So I, I tell students that there, I don't think there's any class I took in college that I don't somehow use something from. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. As I think back about the things I've done, I say, oh yeah, I studied that. I wish I'd paid attention more. Um, so I tell them to pay attention more. Um, so it's, it is a, um, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, we, we use Physics and a lot of it is intuitive. You know, it's not like, you know, the grips sit down with, with calculators, um, and figure out wh how long the rope should be to hang the load for the pendulum to hit the thing. But um, there is a lot of that. You know, if if you think about it, everything we do is somehow physics, and now it's electronics, and now it's you know, and there's so much of that stuff in it that it's that it's. Um, um, you know, we, we, we learn it intuitively, um, but use it, um, you know, very practically. Yes, the prequel. Um, well, what I, it's interesting. I, I, um, I got a call from my agent up in Canada, and she said, you know, they're making a prequel to the thing up here. And I said, really? That's that's fascinating. She said, would you be interested? And I said, well, yeah, that would be kind of fun. So she called him up and said, you know, that I was interested in working on it. Uh, and they said, well, we'll talk to the director about it. We'll get back to you. And they called back pretty quickly the next day and said, you know, he, he said that he would be intimidated. So I didn't get the job. Um, 
And I, I, I was a little underwhelmed by the prequel because I think that, um, you know, a lot of it was derived from what we did. It became kind of a different story. I mean, it was the Norwegian camp or whatever, but it somehow wasn't, and, and it looked different. So um, I, I say it was a, a bold try, but um, I don't know, you know, it, it, it doesn't um, hang around as long as this one has. John wanted a shadow on the wall. <clears throat> but he wanted to make sure that it wasn't recognizable so that you would say, oh, I know who that is. It's Niles. It's uh, whoever. So that was Dick Warlock, the uh, stunt guy. Mm, cool. And and he, uh, you know, had this sort of semi-ambiguous head. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, he, he um, you know, was the silhouette. I have one more question. Uh, and it's completely not related to cinematography, but um, is the when when Fuchs finds the uh, McCready ripped up clothing outside, is that like because the monster has already figured out that that's the clue and they're sort of like leaving fake clues or something? Or, or you guys... that's, a, that's a good question. There were a lot of red herrings, um, you know, which is what you know what a lot of, of um, you know, suspense is built on that. Right, anyway. and it just yeah. sort of breaks the logic, but it also gets your mind going. Yeah. Thinking and like you're, you try to fill in the gaps. Well, and there's there's a few you know, things like that throughout the film that, you know, hopefully, um, you know, what, what do they call, uh, somebody, famous director calls them refrigerator uh, moments. Refrigerator moments. So that you watch the movie. And you go home, and as you open the refrigerator, you say, "Wait, wait yeah. a second! <laughs> this doesn't... How did? Why didn't she just use her cell phone, or you right. know, something like that?" So, so um, you know, it's uh, you know, the film has a few refrigerator questions in it. It's good. It's good to keep it that way. Yeah. Okay, I think that's uh, that's everything, and I hope to see you all at the open house on Thursday. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Indie Shooter, brought to you by Akidio, Band Pro Film and Digital, Black Magic Design, and Carl Size.